on today's Animal Science and Forage webinar series, we're going to discuss tall fescue renovation. So there are a couple of reasons why you might want to consider renovating your pasture or hay field from Kentucky 31 to novel endified tall fescue. The first and most economical is if the pasture needs renovating because of a dead or thinning tall fescue stand. In this picture, you can see a, a picture actually from my dad's farm where there was an area that needed to be renovated. And so during the winter, we actually fed hay there and allowed the animals to muck it up and kind of destroy it and trample it during um, the wet season, which as you can see here, killed out a lot of the forage. So if you have areas that look like this, they'll need to be renovated anyways. And so it's useful to go ahead and make that transition to a novel in the fight tall fescue. The other reason is if you're just really struggling with tall fescue toxicosis. I'm not gonna get into a lot on toxicosis today, but for those of you not familiar, it is caused by an endophytic fungus that lives within the fescue plant that causes vasoconstriction in livestock, which results in heat stress, low feed intake and rate of gain, low pregnancy rates, low birth weight and weaning weight, dystocia or difficulty birthing, and agalactia or reduction or elimination of milk after production after birth. Some producers may find that they see very little tall fescue toxicosis. Other producers may really struggle with it. I would argue that even if you don't see the consequences of tall fescue toxicosis, you are not going to get the maximum animal performance that you could with a non-toxic fescue. But sometimes the economics aren't quite there for complete reestablishment just because of this. But if you are seeing severe tall fescue toxicosis symptoms, it might be worthwhile considering. So there are four main methods that have been researched as a way of renovating pasture from Kentucky 31 to novel tall fescue. So for those of you who have Kentucky 31 are familiar with it, you know it's extremely persistent and stress tolerant. This makes it difficult to kill, as you can imagine. So there are some extra steps. We can't simply just kill out the tall fescue, spray it, and then reestablishment. There are some steps that we need to take in order to ensure that we're getting a actually novel tall fescue stand. Now, some people, um, there's kind of a myth out there that novel endophyte tall fescue can actually change back into Kentucky 31. And on a plant by plant basis, this is not the case. So a novel endophyte tall fescue or even a endophyte free tall fescue, which we don't suggest planting for a variety of reasons, which I don't have time to get into today, those can't revert back. What happens is those, um, especially the endophyte free tall fescue, but even a novel, if they're not managed correctly, will end up dying back. And there's so much Kentucky 31 seed either already in the seed bank in the soil or from a surrounding fields that the Kentucky 31 then creeps back in. So that's how you could have re-encroachment. So that's what we're trying to prevent. So I'm gonna go over these four methods individually and talk about um, how you would do these. So the first is spray smother spray with a summer smother. This consider, is considered probably the best option. Um, it, uh, it has the shortest amount of time between killing the tall fescue Kentucky 31 is an establishment of the novel um, with minimal disruptions in, in pasture availability. So this is a curve showing relative tall fescue yield through the spring, which is when it's the most yielding. The summer, which it doesn't actually grow during the summer. And the fall where you do get some growth, but not as much as the spring. So you wanna conduct your first killing spray in late spring after you get that initial flush. So this will kill your old stand as well as any weeds. We want to not only kill the tall fescue, but also eliminate any weeds that may compete with our novel tall fescue. After spring, we wanna plant a smother crop. These are typically gonna be summer annuals. I'll talk about in a couple of minutes what the options are in planting our smother crop but we would plant that in early summer, just like we would any summer annual. You're gonna no-till that into the existing sod. After you have your smother crop, you're gonna to want to spray again. This is gonna kill any volunteer seedlings, any tillers of fescue that weren't killed in your first spray, 
any additional weeds as well as your smother crop because you want to terminate that. After that second spray, approximately September 15th is when we want to plant our novel tall fescue. Regardless of what fescue we're establishing in Alabama, we suggest a fall establishment to help us get a push on that, that spring growth. Um, some producers do plant it in the spring, but you're going to see a very stressed stand during your first summer, especially if there's not adequate rainfall during your first summer. So by planting it in the fall, we have a good root development and good growth prior to entering the summer, which will allow it to be a little uh, more tolerant of drought and uh, heat stress. So the other option is spray smother spray is going to be the winter smother. So and this is going to look a little bit different and this one's going to take a little bit longer. So the first spray is actually going to happen after the summer. So you're going to graze your tall fescue or cut it for hay during the fall, go through the summer, and you're going to spray that in the early fall, so or late summer, end of August, early September. And this is going to kill your old stand as well as your weeds. Now you don't want to spray when the tall fescue is dormant, so you do want to wait for your fall green up. So if the tall fescue is dormant, you're actually not going to kill it. The herbicide has to have an actively growing stand of fescue in order to be active. So just make sure that you're seeing some amount of green up and growth in your fescue prior to spraying. So in this scenario, you're going to plant a smother crop. It's going to be consisting of cool season annuals, and you're going to plant that from approximately September 15th. Now you'll manage that through your second year. So now we've gone through the winter and we're into the spring of the second year. So we're gonna have that into late spring. We'll have that smother crop. And then we're gonna do a second spray at that point. This is going to uh, spray any escape tillers. So any fescue that didn't die from our first spray, our weeds as well as terminating our smother crop. So this system actually requires a third spray. So you're gonna leave the field fallow during the summer, so it will have residue on it, obviously, but you're not going to mess with it during the summer. So you're going to initiate a third spray, which is going to kill any more tillers that haven't died, fallow weeds, as well as any volunteer seedlings, because we do have a lot of our pastures and all of them are going to have a very weedy seed bank. And so as we open up that canopy and allow sun to reach the soil, you're going to get a lot of weed seeds and seedlings emerge. So you're going to spray again in that late summer, early fall. And you would still plant your tall fescue approximately September 15th to make sure that you get good establishment. In this system, you're still gonna plant, but as you can see, this system takes about 12 to 18 months to follow through because of the time in your spraying and establishing, where with the summer smother crop, you're gonna be a little bit less. So you're gonna be able to do that more of in, in, in one growing season, where this one takes two growing seasons. So for your smother crops, if you're using a summer smother crop, this is the preferred method. You want to use something like sorghum, sorghum sudan grass, or pearl millet. Um, my personal opinion would be to use pearl millet because you, it's more drought tolerant, as well as being uh, resistant to sugarcane aphids, so you don't have to do, worry about those situations. Crabgrass, which I usually am a very big proponent of, is not a great option. And this is because it has very high reseeding potential, which then can become a weed in your fescue and outcompete it. So we want to avoid crabgrass. We're going to no-till it into a sod. We're not going to do prepared seed bed. And uh, there is a prepared seed bed option. Many of our pastures that are in tall fescue, we really don't want to till them because either they're very, have a very high slope, they're on the side of a hill. In other words, it's, they're really prone to erosion, which is a lot of times why they've been established in tall fescue. So these are going to be the options for those, those fields we would prefer not to till because of erosion issues. Now we do on our summer smother crops want to use a lower seeding rate so that light can reach the dead tillers and actually for any of those that have not completely died, allow them to grow. So when we plant, have that second spray, we're able then to again, since they're actively growing, have them die. So for our winter smother crops, the best option is actually cereal rye because it produces a lot of biomass. Um, oats or any winter annual mixture, um, I would probably avoid ryegrass for the same reason we would avoid crabgrass. It has high reed seeding potential and it's going to compete with the fescue. But cereal rye and oats, um, those small grains are going to be the best option. 
Again, you want to use a lower seeding rate, so light reaches undead tillers and allows growth so that when you spray them, it's more effective. So the next option is spray weight spray. So we have the same graph here, our tar fescue growth, and we're going to clip it in late spring. Then we're going to spray this six to seven weeks before we want to plant. And this is going to kill our old stand. Now this six to seven weeks is going to be contingent on how far north you live. So the further north you live, the longer tall fescue will grow into the summer. Um, if you live close to say Auburn, which is kind of the line where we have tall fescue, it's going to go dormant earlier. So this is also something to keep in mind that you need to make sure that it's not dormant. So we want to spray it before it goes semi-dormant in the summer, which could be anywhere from mid-May to mid-June, depending on where you live. We'll conduct a second spray about six weeks after the first spray, and this is going to do volunteer seedlings, escape tillers, and weeds. Again, this might change a little bit. These are generic recommendations coming mostly out of research conducted at Kentucky and North Carolina, which are going to have a later growing season for fescue than we do. So in my opinion, we, that might be a little bit longer. We want to wait till we see some green up in, in the fall. So you may see that being more than a six week period. It may be more um, eight to 10 weeks for the summer. So this is going to kill any volunteer seedlings of weeds um, and escape tillers. So we want to do that second spray just before we're going to plant and then we're going to no-till into the existing seed bank again September 15th. That's our special day that we want to plant any of our cool season um, forages and we're going to plant at that point. This system is not as effective as our smother crops. So um, it's, it's less expensive though and in some respects a little bit quicker because you're able to do it in one growing season, similar to the spray smother spray. But research has shown this isn't quite as effective as killing the tall fescue sand as using a smother crop. So prepared seed bed is our last option. So in this option, we are gonna perform conventional tillage. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we don't wanna do this on any pasture which may be prone to erosion. And that's gonna be many pastures where we're growing tall fescue. So we're going to do a basically a spray till spray through the summer. You're going to spray, kill the stand in late spring, do conventional tillage, and then spray it again. Um, you may also have to do an, an additional spray just prior to establishment in the spring. So this is going to have more labor in that you're going through the field in, in producing tillage. So we have a lot of times we do have forage establishment fails. In this scenario, honestly, we want to make sure it is expensive to put in novel and to fight tall fescue. So we want to avoid failures at all costs. So the main reasons when we might see a failure are poor kill. The tillers and seedlings must grow and contact the herbicide. So we're not getting a good kill of that Kentucky 31 or the weed seeds for that matter. So they're actually out competing our freshly planted forage. Bad seed. So we always want to use certified seed, especially in novel endophyte tall fescue. Um, you're going to see a lot of brown bag seed, especially in Kentucky 31, but we do want to use certified seed when we're doing this. You're planting 2D. Um, it's difficult to see in this picture because we had spray painted the seeds pink, but then we were planting into a red soil. But in that green arrow, you'll actually see one of the tall fescue seeds. So when we're planting, we should actually see some of the seed on top of the ground. If you can't, then if you're having to dig for it, it's too deep. We want to go a quarter to a half an inch uh, and no deeper on our tall fescue. Carryover herbicide. This can affect new seed and preserves old seed and tillers. So you want to make sure the, the herbicide that you're using doesn't have um, any residual effects on new tillers at tall fescue. In our IPM guide for forage and um, hay fields, you will see that we do have restrictions on herbicides that should be used during establishment year of fescue. So those are ones that if they have residues, you don't want to use during your uh, just prior to establishment. Legume competition. So legumes are great in tall fescue, whether you're talking Kentucky 31 or novel endophyte tall fescue, they're always a great addition, but we don't want to plant them right now. 
we want to wait until at least our second year of establishment to think about putting in our clovers. So don't plant the clovers immediately because they actually can't out compete the grass when it's really small. Moisture conditions, be it drought or water logging, we really don't have a lot of control over that. But again, if we plant in the fall, the likelihood of having those conditions is going to be much less than if we plant in the spring. And then soil fertility. Phosphorus and pH along with nitrogen are critical. So make sure you're doing your soil tests prior to establishment. So you're looking at your pH and remember that pH can take 6, 12 or more months to correct and we want to give it the best growing conditions ever. So we want to correct that pH prior to planting. So for grazing management, we really want to make sure in that first year, we're really babying it. So in the first year, you want to consider making hay and not grazing because uh, hay is going to be less stress on the, the stand. This picture here was taken um, in Northwest Georgia at my parents' farm two years after we established a tall fescue stand. Now, typically I wouldn't suggest waiting two years, but actually what happened was uh, the fencing got delayed because of rain and so the fescue wasn't touched for two years. And you can see how well the stand looks. So we really want a baby in that first year so that we can have a good strong stand like this. So we want to reduce any contamination of weed seed from hay bales and manure if you do have to graze. So if you are feeding fescue hay, especially Kentucky 31 fescue hay in a field you just planted in novel endophyte, that Kentucky 31 can outcompete. Compete. There will be seeds not only in the hay, but they actually can be passed through the animal. So also if the animals have been grazing on a Kentucky 31 pasture, you want to give them time in another field to pass that. Give them about, um, it takes three to four days to pass, so about a week before you move them to a new established stand of uh, novel and defied tall fescue. So long-term grazing management of novel endophyte tall fescue is going to be similar to any other forage. It's going to persist much better than endophyte free tall fescue. We don't actually suggest planting endophyte free tall fescue because of its persistence problems. And this includes things um, like Kentucky 32. So still need to manage for persistence. This is something we got a little lazy with, with Kentucky 31 because it's so stress tolerant. But in any forest system, we always want to try to utilize rotational grazing so that we can manage for persistence. We want to make sure that our soil fertility and grazing management are correct because these are the two stresses factors that can be controlled by producers. We can't control rainfall, we can't control the weather, but we can control that we have proper soil fertility and food for our plants, because that's what soil fertility is, and that we're not allowing the animals to overgraze. You can see in this picture right here that this grass is easily three, four, five inches tall, and this is where we want to keep it. We don't want to graze below three to four inches in tall fescue. So intake of non-toxic tall fescue pastures, like novel endophyte tall pastures, tall fescue pastures, is actually going to be greater than that of Kentucky 31. So the reason, one of the reasons that we can continuously graze our Kentucky 31 pastures is because the animals self-limit because of the toxin. They don't have that limiting factor in novel endophyte tall fescue. So overgrazing can be a major problem. Again, why we're able, rotational grazing is going to give us that advantage. So we want to make sure that our um, animals are not able to overgraze, we really want to manage that. And this is what's going to give us long-term persistence. So we want to keep an eye on that because they're, again, not going to have any self-limiting factors. So as I mentioned, rotational grazing is the best way to manage our tall fescue stands or any pasture for that matter. Some type of rotational grazing should be used. It doesn't have to be management intensive. We don't need to be moving animals even once a week. Just moving them every two weeks or every four weeks through different paddocks will make things better and allow pastures to rest. Um, animals with access to toxic and non-toxic fescue at the same time will always prefer the non-toxic, leaving areas undergrazed and areas overgrazed. So especially if you're not renovating your entire farm at once, which actually is something that we don't suggest, I'll get into that in just a second, but you want to make sure that they are only on one or the other. Otherwise, they're going to overgraze portions and undergraze others. So I'm not going to get into a lot of numbers. I am definitely not an economist, but there's some things that I just wanted to keep 
give you as an idea of things to think about when, when thinking about uh, renovating. So the first thing are cost. So obviously there's a large cost of spraying, planting this mother crop, planting the novel tall fescue, as well as any additional feed needs because likely you're gonna have reduced pasture during your conversion and you'll have to supplement with either hay or some kind of feed. So these are things that are gonna cost you money during this process. The benefits are that you're gonna get improved weaning weights, improved breeding rates, and eventually reduce any extra input costs. For example, any supplementation you may have needed while feeding fescue, you can either reduce or eliminate because the animals are gonna perform better on the novel endophyte tall fescue. As you can imagine, these are long-term benefits versus cost in the first year. So it's important to balance that. And if you contact um, any of your Extension regional agents or um, the Extension service, we can help you figure out where that economical point is. So there's different payout years. In general, it takes three to five years to recover the cost um, for renovating tall fescue pasture. So the key drivers of renovation economics are stocking rate. If you, the higher your stocking rate, the more performance um, returns you're going to see. Your cattle performance improvements, be it calf weights, breeding rates, or calf, calf crop survival. These are also are gonna be dependent on your stocking rate. So you're gonna see all of these improvements. It depends on your certain scenario, how much improvements, and that goes into your breed of cattle or livestock, um, these effects have, these are effects on all livestock, but most of the research has been done in cattle. So there's a lot of factors that go into that. Is your pasture at its yield potential? So if you can also improve your yield potential by doing correct soil fertility and rotational grazing and these kinds of things, then that might be something to consider. Also, does all acreage need to be renovated to achieve the benefits of non-fescue? The novel tall fescue. As I mentioned earlier, um, renovating 25 to 50% of your field at once and then waiting is a more economical decision. So renovation of pastures is costly. Producers should evaluate their losses to guide their decision to renovate. Um, it pays to renovate pastures that need it, but only renovating 25 to 50%, as I just mentioned, may be the best most practical approach. Changing to fall calving may also be the best option when renovation is impractical because when you have fall calving you're going to see lower um, effects on your on your cattle performance because they're not going to be consuming the higher levels of endophyte during a time when they have higher needs for nutrition. Uh, I, I put this picture in here is actually of my daughter digging up, helping me dig up some fescue plants for a demonstration. But in this particular scenario, if I had a pasture like this, and this is Kentucky 31, I would not renovate because these are really healthy stand. Um, it's providing a lot of good forage and a lot of availability. So I might consider managing my cattle differently. But if I had a poor stand, then it might be worthwhile to renovate. Like I said, there's a lot of decision factors that have to go in because this is a large monetary commitment. So for more information on any of your forage related questions or problems, please contact us at alabamaforages at auburn.edu. You can also email me at that email to get added to our monthly e-newsletter. Feel free to visit us at alabamaforages.com, which is our official website for any of our publications and content pieces related to forages, as well as follow us on social media.